Magnation, Steve Hilton. Hi, Steve. Hi, Will. Thanks for having me here. Thank you. And we also have Greg Kozinski, who's Hi, head of AV Systems Coyote IoT platforms. It's Hello, Greg. It's a pleasure to be here with you today. Thanks, Greg. In today's webinar, we aim to provide an in-depth technical discussion of the topic, as well as attempting to link to the strategic business impact. We're going to end with the advantages of OMA, OMAR, lightweight M2M, -M, as a technology for IoT device management. First, a few words about AV System. AV System is Poland-based software firm specializing in enabling IoT services for service providers, enterprises, and OEMs, specifically in the area of device management. AV Systems Coyote IoT is a suite of device management and data orchestration platform for OMA lightweight M2M -M based IoT services. It's deployed over the cloud or on enterprise premises. Next, Steve, if you could uh, go ahead, uh, please introduce uh, MacNation. Thanks, Will. So MacNation is an independent IoT technology testing, benchmarking, and design firm. We specialize um, in uh, testing and using IoT software and platforms. We've been in business six years. We're headquartered in the United States. And as I said, we're exclusively focused on enterprise IoT. We provide our clients with fact-based insights and recommendations. And we call them fact-based because all of our research is based on hands-on technology testing. We use IoT technology in our own hands-on IoT um, platform testing and benchmarking lab. And this allows us to provide insights uh, that are based on, on actually using the technology ourselves. Back to you, Will. Thank you, Steve. Now, we're going to tackle three major challenges of IoT device management. First, let me set the stage. What is IoT device management? Why is it even important? When we talk about IoT device management, Generally, a device management platform includes these capabilities, provisioning, registration, bootstrapping, configuration, remote reset, monitoring, diagnostics, firmware management, especially over the air services. We're going to focus a lot on firmware over the air photo services and the security and troubleshooting. First, let's take a look at the characteristics of device IoT devices. IoT devices are typically constrained, small devices with limited CPU, limited memory, and limited power resources, and hundreds and thousands of them out there. You expect them to last for a long time. Firmware management becomes critical for bug fixes, for feature updates, for driver updates, system updates, over the air firmware management FOTA at a large scale is indeed reliably and securely a non trivia task. So let's tackle the issue of FOTA as the first of the three challenges we're discussing today. Steve, MacNation has done research in this area multiple times. Would you please start us off on the photo challenge? Sure, Will. Yeah, so the, the first um, challenge for managing IoT devices at scale is the need to update devices over the air. Um, and I, I mean, there's, there's any number of reasons why that's important. Um, I, I think the first one to think about is first that to update devices, especially remote devices, can be really expensive. Right. So if you've got devices that are, you know, in remote locations in the middle of oil fields or on, you know, cargo tankers in the middle of an ocean, it's really expensive to uh, send a person out uh, to do updating. So 
the challenge of being able to manage a device over the air is really all about uh, making sure that the, the cost to provide the service matches the value of the service or the revenue being generated by the service. Secondly, it's really important to update devices. As you were saying earlier, Will, these devices can last three, five, 10 years or longer. Long lived devices are risky if you do not update them. Um, and I think everybody knows sort of in the world that we live in today, um, you know, vulnerabilities um, that we don't sort of recognize initially with a device can happen over time. Um, and it's really important to be able to effectively and efficiently being able to push out an update um, at scale to devices to make sure that um, all vulnerabilities are patched. And thirdly, it's important to be able to update devices uh, over the air because frankly, at some point, an enterprise or a service provider is gonna want to add additional functionality to the device. Um, and one of the ways to make sure that you can do that in an efficient way is to push out um, a software update over the air. And just to level set, Will, it's probably helpful to say, so if you think about sort of the generalized photo process, photo being firmware over the air, right, this updating process, sort of what happens here? Well, imagine you sort of have a two parties talking to each other. One party is the IoT platform, one party is the IoT device. What's really going on during a photo? Well, in the most simple sense, the platform pings the device and says, are you awake? Is it possible for me to do an, a push to an update to you right now? The device talks back to the platform and says, yes, uh, I have the most relevant um, firmware on the device, the most recent firmware, I'm ready to receive uh, the update. Then the platform sends the update to the device. The device um, uh, updates the firmware. And then the platform issues a reboot command and says uh, to the device, okay, reboot now. And if that's successful, the device sends a message back to the platform saying, A-okay, everything is ready to go. So Steve, what you're saying is not only for maintenance, device maintenance purposes, but also for adding new functionalities. That's great insight, Steve. Yeah, now, absolutely. Well. Now, Greg, could you take us down to the technical details as related to the photo, specifically why OMAR, OMA, lightweight m 2 m is the most suitable technology for solving this challenge? Yes, yeah, sure will. So at the beginning, let me make a clear division of responsibilities. First, we need to have a file. So we have a device vendor. All of, all of you have probably heard about putting backdoors, embedding credentials, or lack of firmware file signing. So let's assume that we have a file ready to be uploaded for your devices. And here, the good device management protocol, there's the picture. There are many ways of implementing firmware updates available on the market. You know, in fact, every platform or device vendor can develop a custom mechanism and claim to have photo support. However, they usually don't guarantee any interoperability of the implementation, which is why the Lightweight M2M protocol offers the leading solution in this field. And what I would like to do is to prove that performing a firmware update is a simple task, provided that you have chosen the Lightweight M2M protocol. Even if, even if a popular file transfer method is to be used, such as the well-known HTTP protocol, there, is a, there, is, there are a number of concerns which must be addressed. These issues are displayed in this slide. So let's take a closer look at messaging protocols because messaging protocols are fairly popular today, right? Um, so messaging protocols like MQTT don't provide any answer to these points, for example. Unless device management uh, operations are defined on top of the messaging protocol, we have no clue, no idea how to transfer uh, data and operations to, to the devices. So that's it. But the Lightweight M2M protocol provides us a lot of flexibility. So let's turn on to the next slide. Yeah. So if we have a file, you can plethora of possibilities. You can use, for example, a dedicated Lightweight M2M server or a separate file server. So the specification allows you to, to, to make a decision where to, store, where to store a file. 
So this is very useful because you can make use of C CDN content deliver network integration, for example. And this is also important uh, because, because the platform can be built in a smart manner. Let's go on to the next slides, Will. Sorry yeah. about that. No problem. So um, let's take a look now how a firmware file can be delivered to a device. So depending on the case, we have many, many possibilities. So a device may pull a file from the server or a lightweight M2M server can push a file to the device. This gives us a lot of more room for improvements. For example, the lightweight M2M specification allows us to allow the server to, to, to make a decision when it, it is a good moment to push the firmware file. For example, uh, when connectivity conditions are bad, when received radio signal is signal is, is, is weak. It's not, it's perhaps not a, not a good, good idea to start a firmware download because this would resu result in huge battery drain. On the other hand, Sometimes you would like to, to provide a location of a file to your device. And it's important that this, the protocol specifies that the this device should start downloading the file at the next practical occasion. So what it means is that the device is not allowed to break the transmission of business crit critical data. Yeah, so... I often, Greg, I often hear from enterprises telling me that uh, they have challenges sometimes just to reach the device. So what you're saying almost, uh, they could be that uh, the transmission, the connectivity is low or having problem yeah. for them. Yeah, exactly. Oh. exactly, exactly. Uh, and the next slide answer uh, your question, I believe. Oh. Let's, Let's go to the next slide. Yeah, so the protocol specifies four states. So it's very easy to retrieve uh, the information about the current device upgrade status. So you may easily match the, the reason of a failure um, or, or, or the current, current status of your devices and have insight into the entire population of, of, of your devices. So it's, it's not only um, a chance to start the firmware transmission at, at the good moment, but also you have a detailed insight. So apart from these four states, the Lightweight M2M protocol specifies uh, update results. So if you have an issue like out of frame uh, during the, 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 the upgrade process or, or there is <clears throat> fault related to, to inability to save a file on your flash memory, you can retrieve that information from the device or the device can send a notification to the server. So you have a detailed insight into your entire population and you have a possibility to track the firmware rollout process globally. So Greg, I learned that uh, Lightweight m 2 as a technology is initiated and uh, maintained by uh, Open Mobile Alliance, OMAR, uh, SpecWorks. So is the technology specifically designed for IoT services? So managing IoT devices, uh, millions of, of them out there, you know, in different states, as you described, the four states in terms of uh, firmware updates, the process going through. So uh, w without a lightweight M2M, how other companies are doing? And uh, are you saying the, the old way of doing things or traditional way of doing things are more error prone? More failure? Yeah, the question is what are what traditional traditional methods are methods are yeah because they are not defined. So if you use a custom implementation of the upgrade process, then probably you're you're able to to upgrade one device, uh, but you lose, for example, inter interoperability. You you cannot be sure that your device will be handled well in a, another platform. And so so you you end up in vendor locking basically. Um, yeah, so let's move on to the next slide and let's let's summarize. So as you can see, we have a well-defined firmware update state machine. We have four states um, delivered by the devices. 
And moreover, we have a live with M2M update object definition. So information about the firmware update status is, is uh, consistent among your population of devices. And moreover, live with M2M solves issues not addressed by messaging protocols because there are that's sort of, of, of uh, things that can not be defined, uh, like how device um, sends information about this, the, the success, how to, how to notify about the success, right? Um, and uh, there are many also, there are also many f file transfer protocols. So there, need, there, the, there is a need to introduce some, some kind of protocol negotiation between a platform and the device. And this is something which is also addressed by the, by the standard. So a device can uh, present what protocols are supported and a good lightweight M2M uh, device management platform can pick one of those protocols. Yeah. All and right, I wanna, Greg, I wanna pick your brain here on, on this uh, webinar. You know, on your second bullet point, you mentioned uh, uh, lightweight M2M is, uh, you know, uh, addressing problems not currently addressed by other messaging protocols. But can they coexist? Yeah, sure. There is no issue. Uh, you can use both protocols. You can implement device having bo both technology stacks. Uh, but it's important that uh, that messaging protocols don't uh, address um, any device management operations. There are no no, no def defined operations and 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 the data formats to be exchanged back and forth from devices. Uh, so. Whatever you implement is, is, is probably relevant to the specific platform. Um, the device management protocol specifies not only photo, photo, photo process, right? But, but also configuration changes, uh, telemetry data handling, because you can also trans transport telemetry data using cloud with M2M using uh, observe mechanism on the co-op layer. Co-op stands for co constraint application protocol, which, which is an underlying uh, protocol of flight with M2M. Um, so there is a whole bunch of features delivered by Lightweight M2M, which are not even addressed by messaging protocols. Messaging protocols like AMQP or MQTT deliver only a way to exchange data between uh, nodes. So that's it. Greg, um, uh, you, you brought up a good point when you mentioned the COA constrained you know, application protocol. So as a matter of fact, what I heard is that uh, Lightweight M2M, the technology stack, is that it sits on top of co-app. Can you expand on that a little bit? Yes, constraint application protocol is a binary uh, protocol. So what it means is that, that you, can, uh, you, you, you can transfer uh, very efficient, efficient, efficiently uh, messages between uh, devices and servers. Um, but one of the examples that, that, uh, that, that describes benefits of, of using co-op is um, that COP supports using very small messages. Um, so in, in, in constraint networks like narrowband IoT networks, where when you have very, very low MTU, MTU is, is maximum transmission unit, um, then you can have huge benefits from using COP because um, usually data ground trans, tra transport protocols uh, does not support uh, segmentation and resequencing. So if you transfer a large file um, o o o over over uh, data ground transport uh, protocols, then you have file size limit because device constrained device is not able to to reorder and 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 merge all the pieces together. So uh, in case of transferring bigger files, like firmware files, it's important to allow devices to, um, to, 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 to collect the file without any issues. So there is a feature called, um, called um, blockwise transfer on the co-op layer, which solves this issue. So basically it's possible to transfer a file in blocks which are adjusted and, and, and um, meet MTU size. So you don't have, huge fragmentation here. And the, 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 this is one of the advantages of the lightweight M2M protocol as well. Excellent. That seems to be the lightweight M2M offers the easiest way to do just that for file transferring at the minimum. All right, let's go to the next slide. Uh, sum this up for, for us, uh, Greg. Okay, so long story short, you can have um, any solution, but um, 
as soon as you have thousands of devices, real issues can be revealed. So um, if you have a very simple solution that will work for, for, for a few devices, but as soon as you reach um, a huge amount of devices, millions of devices, uh, there is a chance that you need to have a very detailed insight into the, the entire population, into the entire fleet. So this is where Lightweight M2M allows you to have full control over all your devices in the field. Right. The, the, key, the key thing, the fundamental uh, challenge is the, you know, the, the number of devices out there, the sensors and controllers, and what you want to do with that device, right? Telemetry data needs to report it, need to be uh, helping aiding business decisions at the end of the day, tracking, but also for decision making. That's uh, that's really insightful, and uh, this is a great uh, segue into our uh, next uh, topic, uh, challenge number two: avoiding uh, vendor lock-in. I saw I go around talking with enterprises and the service providers. A major challenge for users is to avoid cost iron single vendor approach. You know, if we learn anything, we learn from the uh, old days, the ERP, CRM days, is that you want to leave yourself more options. Multi-vendor approach, a technology that extensible, flexible, especially in the world of IoT, given it's a evolving a business case, evolving use cases. Now we got a 5G breathing down our neck. So a lot of things still unimaginable today as you and I are sitting here, but uh, gonna be become a reality. So um, <clears throat> you want to uh, select a technology that's open, standards-based uh, platform, a multi-vendor support, and uh, give you the flexibility. Steve, now I'm gonna turn to you. Your firm has done uh, some work in this area. Please go ahead. Tell us what you find. Sure, Will. I mean, I think this is a really important challenge um, for managing IoT devices at scale, right? So fact of the matter is that most enterprise deployment and pretty much 100% of every service provider deployment involves heterogeneous devices, right? So, I mean, if you think about sort of the typical deployment approach at the enterprise, it's, you know, uh, you know, come up with an IoT strategy, a series of tactics, sort of your business KPIs you're going to measure, create a POC, right? At some point, prove the POC from a technology perspective, and then move forward into, you know, a pilot or further, right? But that's really just the first stage. Um, enterprise, you know, the first IoT solution in an enterprise spawns the second and the third and the fourth solution, right? And, and so these deployments end up having heterogeneous devices. And so being able to support all those different devices on the same protocol becomes really important from a financial perspective, from a technology perspective, we've talked a lot about that, but from a financial perspective, you know, running multiple protocols and multiple platforms can be a challenge, you know, to make sure that the, the business is gonna make its ROI. Secondly, as enterprises layer on more IoT solutions, the first, the second, the third, the fourth, the device management requirements do increase. Um, you know, while it's true that a lot of the um, inherent technology and capabilities inside a horizontal platform can supply most of the device requirements um, needed, um, you know, each solution has some unique little bells and whistles that require um, additional capabilities and that, that can increase um, the requirements of the device management solution. And thirdly, as Will, you were, you were just saying, you know, enterprises and service providers are concerned about being tied to one device vendor uh, or one software vendor. And in the case where you've got proprietary protocol, proprietary development being done on devices, so the 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 uh, the software, the protocols, the the firmware being used on the devices, where everything is protocol, where everything is proprietary, uh, you end up being tied, you know, to one device vendor, or software vendor, and that that is a real problem um, uh, moving forward. I mean, in theory, you know, 
enterprises and service providers want the flexibility to be able to port you know, a protocol from one device to another device, right? A matching device from a different vendor. Similarly, from one software platform to another platform. Well, let me ask you this, Steve. That's a good point you just made. Uh, do you observe as a research firm any differences uh, or approaches uh, between different verticals? Like, you know, say healthcare versus uh, transportation i'm just picking some names from there over there <laughs> literally yeah. oh that's a really good question will so in the case of device management the differences are generally not vertical to vertical interestingly enough now for data management and analytics and at the stuff higher up in the stack Absolutely, there are vertical differences. But when it comes to device management, you know what the biggest difference is um, in terms of requirements and the way you deploy and implement? It's really around the type of device. So there's a big difference between um, how one thinks about device management for very low power, low processing devices, right? That don't have any edge capabilities that basically sort of beep on, you know, send a little flit of data and sort of turn off, right? That kind of device is really different from a device management perspective than you know a heavy um, edge-based um, uh, uh, device you know that's doing a lot of processing at the edge and running applications at the edge and having high requirements. So that, that's a really interesting question. That, that's really the differences for device management. It's not really a a, a, um, a horizontal. It's not really a, a, a vertical industry thing. So it's more use case driven. You want to track. Uh... But there's a difference between you mentioned earlier the word ocean scared me a little bit so if i have to be the one the technician go update a device in the ocean so don't send me for sure uh, but also thinking the use case of that versus uh, updating a, a device up in the himalayas <laughs> so that yeah, I mean, it's, it's a good point. I mean, there's a difference between, you know, a little low power device that's sitting, um, you know, in, in a parking garage or on the floor of a parking garage monitoring whether a car is there or not versus a device that's sitting on a factory floor, um, you know, attached to a PLC delivering huge amounts of, you know, robotics data, right? Doing a lot of processing of the robotics data and then sending a lot of and then sending some of it back to the cloud for other types of analytics. So that, those are the big differences, I think, for device management. It's exactly right. Excellent point. Greg, you got something to add to this? Yeah, of course. Uh, so from my experience, um, I don't see many people which which uh, wonder about these issues at the beginning, at least. Um, so usually you have a developer which need, needs to to perform a POC, so so he or she can get one of the device um, software development kits, um, and a software embedded embed, embed developer can use a ready to use solution, but usually um, this forces user or company at the end to use a specific platform and corresponding device SDK. So while many platforms on the market provide some kind of auto discovery, which is a very, very good uh, feature because you simply plug a device in and it show up in your inventory among with all, all, all the features. Uh, let's focus now on how it is possible to, to, to add also interoperability to auto discovery. In general, we have two ways. Some platform platform uh, vendors define digital twins. So digital twins are usually defined as virtual device models. So uh, this, uh, such a model can def define some device capabilities and even bindings to the communication protocols. But it only allows you to use auto discovery because this solution will work only with a specific platform. But definitions are not um, compliant with other platforms. So that said, so let's now turn on to the next slide and see the yeah. live M2M way. Yeah, before we see the new way, uh, next slide, let me uh, let me ask you. So Steve just mentioned uh, here, <clears throat> this, uh, you know, uh, vendor lockdown, the impact is you end up with uh, uh, each implementation becomes a one-off yeah. customized effort, as you just pointed it out. And that's a, a huge waste of time and money. 
And uh, it's just simply not scalable, especially we're coming to the world of IoT, right? So uh, that that's uh, the, I, I'm really looking forward to what you have to say about the, the new way of uh, of doing it. Okay, let's go on. Okay, so please note that the Lightning M2M protocol does not only provide a convention for for interchanging messages between devices, such as like such as device management operations, photo configuration change. Um, and, and, and enabling observations. So it's also suitable for, for, for telemetry. Uh, but also there is Open Mobile Alliance Lightweight M2M Object and Resource Registry. Uh, lightweight M2M Object is defined in a single file. It's XML file, but it's, it's a very, very simple definition. So you specify capabilities of a device, data format, for, for communication between the platform and the device. And moreover, this registry is public. So if you have some not standard requirements, you may define your own private objects. But if you want to implement an asset tracker, it's very, very likely that you simply need to open that Open Mobile Alliance registry and compose your device of uh, ready to use blocks. So this is like, like um, we have module, modular way of defining devices. Uh, objects can have and uh, objects can have versions, and uh, so you can upgrade your devices using uh, new definitions. And if you public your own definition of uh, capabilities such as temperature or, or location, there are many mandatory objects as well, like like with M2M server definition, um, connectivity monitoring. They have many useful resources already implemented. Um, so that's it. If you public your definition, any platform vendor can 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 implement uh, your object as well. So it's very likely that your device, your new service will also be compliant with any other uh, platform. So this this is true interoperability, and what we uh, what we experienced at AV system, we observed some customers who simply connected a device and it worked out of the box. It's, it was probably a weather station um, last week, which which was plug, plugged in and and we were able to use all the features uh, on the device. No development at, at the platform side. Oh, Greg, that's good. You know, I want to zoom in a little bit into the second, onto the second point you made about uh, about interoperability, right? So that's a big topic. Uh, you know, every uh, enterprise uh, service providers, when they embark in, on a uh, IoT uh, service, and first and foremost, they need to consider is uh, interop uh, interop testing. Uh, either, you know, ideally, you have a platform that allows you to do automated testing, make sure all the device ecosystem vendors uh, work in unison, and also standards-based. My understanding is Lightweight M2M is the common platform and uh, facilitating the interop. Is, is there something else you can, uh, you can uh, expand on that? I think you covered this topic. So we can right. move on to the next one. <laughs> All right, I'm learning fast. I'm learning fast, Greg. Thank you. Uh, folks on the phone, uh, just to bring you in uh, to uh, where uh, midway through or uh, two thirds the way through our uh, webinar today. And uh, you notice that uh, we try to uh, create a more of a dialogue here. The two things we, we try to do uh, make it different from uh, you know uh, other uh, webinars, one, we're creating a dialogue, exploration, and a discussion instead of a presentation. Number two, we also want to provide the technical depth, uh, deep technical knowledge, how it works, open the hood like Greg is doing for us. Marry that knowledge with the market reality, what's going on with the business drivers, with use cases such as Steve uh, mentioned. Uh, on this webinar so far already. All right, I'll stop uh, uh, here and uh, let's move on to the third and the last uh, three uh, challenges we're discussing today. So one of the biggest issues in IoT service deployment is technology fragmentation. 
enterprises need to invest in open standards-based platform, scalable, and uh, to uh, support their various use cases. Even one single enterprise could have a multiple cases uh, they offer a uh, monetize their IoT service. With that, you know, I want to turn to Steve again uh, for his comment. Steve. Thanks, Will. Yeah, I mean, you, you bring up a really good point. So providing this standardized protocol for device management is really important. I think the first main reason is the one you just alluded to, right? It allows enterprises to create multiple IoT solutions using the same device management protocol. I mean, what would be a good example? Uh, even, even an automotive manufacturer, right? This kind of manufacturer is going to be, you know, building cars, right, and, and layering IoT solutions into the cars. And those solutions would be um, anything that includes sort of infotainment and engine diagnostics and emergency call, right? There's three solutions right there. But, but that same automotive manufacturer who is offering a connected product in the market also is probably using uh, connected solutions inside its factory, right, for factory automation, for uh, warehousing and logistics, um, for um, various machine learning applications, probably on some of the equipment in its factory. All right, so there are the myriad solutions um, that a single enterprise, in this case, an automotive manufacturer, would want to be able to launch using the same device management protocol. I think the second um, thing to keep in mind why these standardized protocol for device management are so important and, and it, honestly, Greg touched on this a lot today, is that the, that other legacy type protocols only solve 50% of the problem, right? So if you're only solving the issue associated with, with messaging and sort of how messages are transferred um, from device to platform, you're really only solving 50% of the problem, right? You're missing that, that ever critical part um, of, of device management as well. Right, right. I, I think you also have some specifics you want to you want to offer uh, insight to this audience today. I hope this is the right slide for you. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, I, I, you know, Lightweight M to M provides this kind of standard protocol for device management at scale, right? That and and that standardized bit is the important part, right? It allows a developer to specify the most important device management aspects from day zero. I mean, so often um, we find that um, an enterprise will create an IoT solution as a, as a proof of concept. It'll work really well, right? For one or two devices, you can manage one or two devices without you know, a standardized protocol, no problem, right? However, as soon as you take that POC and try to scale it up, one learns very quickly, as Greg pointed out, uh, that you're going to run into problems uh, uh, with device management if you don't have a way to uh, 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 standardize the protocol um, and be able to manage things then at scale. Right. So designing that device management aspect from day zero, right, from the point of, of planning out the POC is really, really important. Don't don't wait until later. Um, uh, to, to a light on a, on a standardized protocol for, for your device management aspects. Secondly, uh, and related is ensuring that the IoT solution performs well in the POC environment and the production environment. Um, the environments are really different. Um, you know, planning ahead is the most, in, in, most important part and then picking a, both a protocol and a platform that can support um, sort of the, 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 the at, at scale deployment is really important. Offer um, lightweight man, lightweight MTEM also offers this standardized type protocol with extensibility for use case specific features. I think of it as sort of following the 80-20 rule, right? Whereas lightweight MTEM provides the structure and the the structure with its objects um, approach, right? So you can you can solve really 80% of your requirements with 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 that objects based approach, right? And and make all the specifications you need. However, at the same time, probably there's 20% of every IoT solution that requires a little bit of flexibility and needs some things um, that will be added on top of, of um, um, the base structure, 
right? And, and once again, lightweight end to end provides that ability to add additional flexibility with some custom objects. Very good. You know, this is uh, pretty obvious to me just in the last 40 minutes, the, the three of us chatting here regarding uh, device management, uh, IoT device management, and leveraging standards based protocol like lightweight M2M uh, is so important. But, you know, I've read uh, research notes uh, saying, you know, one of the biggest, uh, most overlooked area in the IoT uh, implementation is device management. And, uh, you know, the functionalities, the features I listed out at the very beginning of this webinar, and uh, companies are still overlooking them, not having a well thought through process device onboarding, interop testing, automation, you know, so on and so forth. So I'm gonna throw back at you, Steve. Why do you think that is? Why is device management is underinvested or overlooked? Or enterprise is just not quite spending the kind of uh, time and the money uh, in this area? Well, it's a good question, Will. You know, interestingly, I think three years ago, on, on, in, uh, we wrote at Mac Nation a white paper about this very topic, which is um, the idea that, that enterprises fixate on the concepts of analytics and data management and that sort of sexy stuff at the top of the stack. And they, they underinvest in device management. In fact, I, I think we have that white paper still on our website. It's free. You could probably go to our website and search for device management, data management, and it'll pop up. Um, and I, I think it happens probably because the people that are making decisions about device layer protocols and things to do with devices for an implementation are sometimes different from the people inside the enterprise making decisions about the platform and the applications layer. And, and there, because there's sort of a, um, maybe sometimes even a lack of communication. Um, the, the folks that are thinking about sort of the data that's coming out, right, um, aren't also thinking about the device and vice versa. The people that are thinking about the device aren't thinking about the data. And so I think we end up with a situation where um, the device level characteristics are sort of put off to the side and not thought about, or sometimes even thought about as like plumbing. You know, it's not very exciting, but you know, if you have a house without plumbing, you, you kind of, you know, have a, a, a rough situation in your house. I, I, I like your, I like, I like your analogy here, uh, the plumbing. Yeah, it's, uh, it's not as sexy as the top level. But also, uh, Steve, uh, sorry to uh, interrupt you there for a second. Uh, is the issue of uh, device management involves just every participant in the ecosystem. You got to work with device manufacturers, right? And that's the, I'd say, IoT endpoint who depends on a, a radio chipset from a chipset vendor. Uh, and then you turn into a module provider. Then you turn it into a system integrator. And then you got to bring in, it's not just tech technology anymore. IoT is not a technology. IoT is a service, it's a business, right? So you got to bring in product, your internally, your engineering side. And your product management, your marketing, your business executives. So it involves more more moving parts versus a old, you know, in the ERP days, you know, technology implementation. Would you agree with that? I, I would, Will. I mean, I think people underestimate how hard device management really is. It touches so many aspects of the entire IoT solution. And I think the, the, the difficulty of doing this right, not only at POC, but at scale, um, really separates sort of the wheat from the chaff, right? I mean, it, it's, it's hard to do and takes, takes some good work and it's important to find the protocols and the platforms that really excel um, in these areas. But I got the good news, I think, today, that what I learned, you know, the last 45 minutes is that uh, help is on the way. We got a standard, industry standard, organized by a global organization, OMA Specworks, and uh, it's lightweight M2M, and uh, there are uh, 
vendors out there supporting it and wholeheartedly. So I certainly learned a lot in the last 45 minutes, Steve and Greg. Thank you very much for your insights. Uh, I'm going to try to attempt to uh, summarize uh, what I learned, <laughs> what we covered today, and then we're going to open the floor, literally, <laughs> virtually, open the floor for our audience to, uh, to chat back with us. All right, so we covered in the last 45 minutes uh, three challenges in the scalable IoT device management area. So one, you know, a firmware over the air. Is what is uh, lightweight M2M can do from interoperability perspective, from supporting different scenarios of uh, file transfer, uh, file uploads, dynamic photo campaigns, so on and so forth. Then we moved on to cover the device types, right? Managing multiple device types, multiple technologies, and uh, multiple vendors to avoid a vendor uh, lock in to paint yourself into a corner. Give yourself the flexibility. You got a future proof. Literally, this is not a cliche anymore because everybody understands IoT is an evolving field. And with 5G, you know, uh, there's a lot of things. We're just at the cusp of, of it at the moment. So you, you do not want to paint yourself into a corner. A flexible, scalable, open platform standards based. That's where you want to go. That's what I learned from you folks here, uh, Greg and Steve. Third one uh, we covered, the challenge, is providing a standardized uh, protocol, right? So uh, that's uh, essentially covers uh, everything we've been discussing today. All right, we got about uh, 10 minutes left uh, in our uh, time block. I'm going to uh, open the floor uh, for questions and answers. And uh, folks, uh, we got a back office operations folks there uh, ready to take your questions. What you can do is uh, you text uh, your questions to the chat box uh, in front of you uh, on the screen. Uh, I think it's a lower bottom right corner. And uh, type in your, your, your questions. Uh, I'm sure Greg and Steve, uh, uh, even me, I'll chime in. Uh, I'm not shy. So uh, what's your questions? Uh, the floor is open. OK, I can see one question. I wonder how does photo work on a large scale? Well, a photo process is defined by the by the standard, by the protocol. So it all depends on the Lightweight M2M platform. So if you have a good Lightweight M2M platform, device management platform, then it will work on a large scale. Uh, usually issues arise when you manage thousands of devices um, and the process is not defined well because um, imagine, if, for example, a case uh, when you're not able to easily easy, easily visualize the progress of upgrading devices to several software versions uh, simultan simultaneously, as for example, the application server can only be informed about, about successes or failures without any matching between the upgraded devices and the target software versions. So you need to have a platform which is aware of the situ situation in the field. And if you have a lightweight M2M server, which supports group operations, group photo, mass cam campaigns, in other words, then it will work. And um, this will work, it, it will work for sure, basically. In case of different protocols, you need to rely on somebody else uh, design and expertise. Right, do we have an, another we have question? Yes, I think we have one question related to market ad market ad adaptation. Market adaptation. Could you read the question, the full question? How, how is the market adaptation for Lightweight M2M progressing in IoT? Well, I'll start off. I think Steve probably have more uh, insight uh, into that. But I'll start off with uh, you know our experience at AV System. So Lightweight M2M as a technology has been around for four or five years, right? 
So it's, uh, it's beyond version one now, and uh, version two is on the horizon, and the technology is evolving. And the, uh, the, the, a lot of these uh, lightweight M1 advantages, you know, um, uh, is uh, very, uh, very uh, adaptable to a cellular based uh, IoT network, such as narrowband IoT, CADM networks. So you can see service providers probably the most aggressive in uh, adopting uh, lightweight M2M -M for device management. And also I think automotive industry is not far behind uh, either. So uh, that's kind of a, what we are hearing market adoption um, across the industries, right? I even hear from for instance, a CPG uh, company, a global 500 uh, CPG consumer packaged goods uh, industry, things you and I deal as a consumer deal with on a daily basis. Uh, they're expanding their uh, IoT offering or their technology stack into a cellular uh, MB IoT, and therefore they're looking into lightweight M2M uh, to facilitate that. So um, that's my uh, quick uh, quick reaction to that question. Uh, Steve may have more. Mm -hmm. No, well, that was good. I mean, every service provider we talk to asks about it, right? And has interest in how to use lightweight M to M and sort of build it into sort of their process. Because because every service provider is interested in sort of. Uh, you know, we build it and they will come right like sort of mass deployment is really important in that environment. Um, I, I would also say that I think as we continue to see lightweight M2M and the lightweight M2M clients become more and more productized, um, we're going to see more adoption of it, right? So the ability for um, an enterprise to 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 create a client, push it out to a device on its own, I think would be really, really important um, and will continue to fuel um, development um, and interest in the in the spec. Right. Okay, so uh, let's focus on the next question. Is the lightweight M2M also the right protocol for IoT devices? Uh, can it query, for example, a user and client database? Let me answer this question. Uh, yes, it's a, the right protocol for provisioning IoT devices. Provisioning is, is, is a term um, frequently used in telco environment, but provisioning in essence is applying new services and configuring a device according to, to some entries in a database. So the lightweight M2M protocol can apply information collected from databases to the device. So as an example, if you have a lightweight M2M server, you need to, to um, make an integration with your database, or it can be a database of your IoT platform as well. Or the device management platform can have its own database with uh, user met metadata. So the lightweight M2M protocol can provide um, configuration to your devices according to information collected from, from, from databases. Another example, which uh, which probably answers this question, is that um, in case of very complex devices, it's possible to implement some logic on the device side. For example, we uh, had a case when a device, mm, it was possible to configure a custom endpoint for telemetry data on the device side. So the lightweight M2M protocol was used to configure a device to send telemetry data using a custom protocol to a specific endpoint somewhere on the internet. So in this case, it was possible to use the lightweight M2M to configure a device to directly interact with another system. Okay, next question. Uh, okay, maybe it's, 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 it's for someone else. Uh, hello, I have a question regarding multi-vendor or single vendor approach. How big is the issue of a single vendor approach? Oh my goodness. <laughs> um, it, it's only an issue, you know, like everything else in life, right? It's only an issue if it's uh, preventing you to get things done. What do you want to accomplish, the objective, right? So uh, we are pointing this out in you know, a single vendor approach is uh, 
is that you want to give yourself more flexibility. I have never, um, in recent years, uh, I have never seen any, op let's say, uh, uh, a, a enterprise wanted to have a, a, a device from a single vendor for you know commercial reasons, for technical reasons, and uh, you want to give yourself flexibility. So how big that is, it really depends on your company's uh, objective. And uh, you, you want to be, uh, you, you don't mind that you, you, you're dealing with a single vendor, you think this is the best uh, uh, there is, there's only one thing in the world for it, I'm gonna go for it, right? So it's almost like I tell my kids, don't put all your eggs in, in one basket. <laughs> so for commercial, it's, it's more than just technical reasons, it's uh, commercial reasons. So that's why uh, I, I don't mean to be a dismissive of the question, but it is a big and uh, all the uh, enterprises and service providers that uh, I've been dealing with uh, in my career has been uh, learning the, the lessons from uh, you know early days, dot com days, is that you want to be bleeding edge, you want to be cutting edge, you want to create that the technological advantage over your competition. But at the same time, you don't want to paint yourself in a corner, give yourself uh, a flexibility, extensibility to extend. So uh, I think it, it is a huge to me. Okay, we um, are about to end. Uh, I will quickly answer two last questions. Uh, first one is, uh, constraint application protocol works on UDP. What if UDP is filtered? Uh, the, the latest specification of the lightweight end-to-end -end protocol, the version 1.1, uh, specify additional transport bindings. So uh, in essence, it's, it's possible to use co-op over TCP protocol. And that's what, what our platform supports, for example. And next question is, what is the risk of not considering IoT in device management from the beginning? Or when should an enterprise consider IoT device management re relative to IoT analytics, IoT application development, and others? So my question, um, my answer is uh, that the device management is uh, understood in many ways. So some platform vendors understand device management just and as entry point for, for your devices. Uh, you need to provide authentication for your devices, manage certificates, group devices. Uh, but the full device management term um, covers also group management and provisioning, configuring your devices. So uh, even if you have a very basic solution and, and, and a small amount of devices, you need to have that component in, in your network. So if you leave um, the decision to choose the device management solution at the end, you will have a difficulty to, to integrate that with IoT analytics platform and user database, CRM, or OSS BSS platforms. So um, it's a good idea to start with the device management from my perspective. So we only got a minute and a half left, but I want to add quickly to this point. It's not a matter of when. It is a matter of who, what do I mean by that? Meaning I engage, we engage with an AV system, engage with service providers. So when they talk about devices, they have a device team, they have a QA team, a device QA team, they have a business development team working with manufacturers out there, but they also have network management team. They also have product management team. So my question, my answer to the question the uh, audience raised is this, it's not a win. We already, we already answered that from the very beginning. From the very, very beginning of your IoT journey, you gotta consider IoT device management. But bring in your vendors, bring in your internal constituencies. And uh, the, the network side is not just this device. So nothing more important than get the device right. In order to get a device right, you gotta have a get the device management platform right. The network edge intelligence aid our decision making day in, day out. So that's my conclusion for the folks today. Okay. With yeah. that, oh, go ahead. Uh, yeah, uh, I, I think that we have uh, more questions um, in the queue, but sorry to not answer them all. But we, we encourage you to contact uh, sales at apsystem.com and we also try to answer the remaining questions um, by emailing you. Thank, thank you, Greg. Thank you. Yes, we're running out of time. and. Uh, 
but we we're, we're, we like to think this is the beginning of our engagement with you. Uh, feel free to contact us through various means. Okay, with that, that's a wrap for today. I want to thank uh, Steve Hilton of Mac Nation, Greg Kozinski from uh, uh, AV System uh, for insightful webinar. Uh, look forward to uh, future uh, discussions. Thank you. I want to thank the audience as well. Thank you, everyone. Have a good day. Bye-bye.